evening, coaches! Mike exclaimed, disgusted, as the small controller strode away from the sheds. What do we need dining coaches for? Regular coaches are bad enough. It sounds like a good idea to me. Offering a lunch service on the trains in the middle of the day? I mean, sounds like it'll attract a few more passengers. The small controller did say our schedules wouldn't change, Mike. It's just an extra couple of coaches in the midday run to Peel Godred. An extra couple of delicate coaches, yes. My driver's told me about dining coaches. They've got to be treated even more preciously than regular coaches. It's needless fuss. The other engines exchanged a look. It wasn't unusual for Mike to complain like this whenever changes were made to the passenger schedule, but they knew that for all of his bluster, Mike would still do his job. A couple of days later, the dining coaches were put into service. The luncheon, as the midday train had been renamed, ran smoothly for the first few days. The passengers enjoyed the scenery with their lunch, and the food was reported to be quite good. It was raining lightly one morning, as Mike prepared for his first run with the luncheon. He eyed the dining coaches suspiciously as he chuffed up alongside. He'd seen how the station pilot, Blister 2, had been handling them very carefully. So these are the dining coaches, are they? For new cars, they look rather old-fashioned. Oh, they've got the latest mod cons. Fridges, a microwave, and even a small oven in each. I see. A few minutes later, Mike was backing down onto the train. Normally he braked when his buffers touched those of the coach behind, but this time he stopped short. His driver glanced back. Alright, we've just got a few inches left. He opened Mike's regulator slightly, and the miniature engine crept back, gently buffering up to the coaches. Is all this fuss really necessary? I mean, they are just coaches. It is appreciated. I mean, I'm just getting the soup ready now. Mike looked back, startled. A moment later, he realized that had been the cook in the lead coach. Soup? Yes, the soup. It is tomato today. Mike couldn't have cared less what the soup du jour was. He just wanted to get going. A few minutes later, the passengers had boarded and Mike departed. Gradually, he brought the train up to speed. He wasn't just being careful. With the extra weight of the dining coaches, the train was a bit heavier than usual. Despite the slow start, they made good time along the line. But for each stop, Mike had to brake gently and sooner, then start out carefully. Thanks to this, he had to work harder between stations in order to keep on schedule. By the time the train reached Arlesdale, the rain had become a downpour and a strong wind was blowing. Mike's wheels skidded slightly as he stopped at the station. He glanced down, worried. Driver, I'm going to need some sand for this departure. Mike's driver obliged. As his driver opened the regulator, Mike dug in with his wheels, trying to get the heavy train moving. But his wheels slipped on the rails, and he struggled to move the train. More steam, please, driver. He had it a moment later, and he strained forward. Suddenly, his wheels got a proper grip on the rails. His train jerked forward. Unheard by the engine, a startled shriek sounded from the second dining coach. There we go. Mike exclaimed triumphantly, and he proceeded on his way. Mike finished his run without any further incidents, and returned to Arlesborough a few hours later. As he arrived at the station, he spotted the small controller waiting for him. He did not look happy. Mike, what does I hear about a rough star at Arlesburg? I had a rather irate passenger demanding we pay a dry cleaning bill. You do want us to keep to our schedules, don't you, sir? Yes, of course. Then I had to get the train started somehow. Mike explained what had happened. When he'd finished, the small controller nodded thoughtfully. I see. It may be best, if such situation arises again, that you warn the passengers in the dining coaches that something like that may occur. Yes, sir. As Mike headed for the shed, he couldn't help feeling rather annoyed. All this fuss over something as little as a few drops of soup. Are you alright, Mike? Those dining coaches. I knew they'd cause a fuss. One unavoidable rough start and the passengers are complaining left, right and centre. What happened? Mike told Rex the whole story. Well, small controller's not holding it against you, is he? 
We've been through this before, Mike. I know, I know. Taking passengers helps keep the railway running. Rex just sighed. Things went smoothly over the next couple of days. On Friday evening, the small controller came to see the engines in the shed. Good evening, engines. I've dropped by to advise you that there will be some changes in tomorrow's schedule. We've had a special train charters. Is it for another scout camp, sir? That was one of the more common special charters, as the trains could reach parts of the forest which were otherwise inaccessible. Actually, it's a wedding train. The ceremony is being held in that little forest clearing just up from Marthways. Oh, that sounds nice. Uh, who's going to be taking the special, sir? Well, the maid of honour has organised the train, and she requested that Bert takes it. Me? Oh, am I to be the something blue again? <laughs> you are indeed, Bert. It'll be an honour, sir. Naturally, I've had to rearrange your schedules slightly. Continued the small controller, and he outlined the details. Once he had left, Bert looked over at Mike, slightly worried. So you'll be covering the luncheon tomorrow? Well, that's what the small controller said. Oh, that's those blasted dining coaches again, isn't it? Couldn't he have given that to someone else? I'm sure the controller has his reasons, Mike. Rex grinned mischievously. Mike, maybe you'd better ask the cook to serve chicken noodle soup tomorrow. What's that got to do with it? It's a clear broth with chicken and noodles in it. At least, that's what it looks like when my driver drinks it. So? Asked Mike. So it shouldn't leave too much of a stain on your passenger's clothes. Mike glared as the other engines laughed. Oh, bite down. With that, he departed in a huff. Early the next morning, Frank departed to deliver the chairs and decorations for the wedding. A few hours later, Bert was just being polished when Blister 1 stopped alongside. Bert, isn't there usually food that needs to go up with these sort of weddings too? You know, like appetizers and that sort of thing? That's usually the case, yes. This was usually sent up on a second train, just before the wedding was due to start. It's just that we've not got a food delivery schedule for this one. Are you sure? Yeah, I checked with B2. He's not heard anything about it either. They could just have made alternative arrangements. I recall one wedding Jock looked after a few years ago. They had the ceremony in the forest, then headed up to Arlesborough for the reception and speeches. I suppose that makes sense, replied Blister One, and he departed. Just after 1.30, Bert was departing with the wedding train. The lucky couple were already aboard, as were their guests. He made sure to be gentle as he brought the train up to speed. It wouldn't do for anything to spoil their special day. But all the same, he couldn't help worrying about his conversation with Blister One. A short while later, Mike was bringing the return leg of the luncheon down the line. His trip had been going smoothly, but as he came down out of the mountains, the digital radio in his cab crackled into life. Control, this is Bert Alpha. Can you confirm there was no food delivery scheduled for the wedding charter today? Normally, Mike would have ignored the chatter from the radio, but... Having handled a wedding charter in 2008, Mike usually paid attention to what happened with them. That's affirmative, Burn Alpha. No food was provided to be delivered. For a couple of minutes, there was just the usual radio chatter. Then Bert's driver made another call. Control, Bert Alpha. It seems the caterers thought the food was to be picked up. It's been sorted now, but they've got to prepare a new batch. It'll take about three hours to cook and get it here. We'll need permission to move up to Marthwaite to collect it. Mike didn't hear the reply from Control, as an idea came to him. They've got the latest mod cons. Fridges, a microwave, and even a small oven in each. What are you talking about, Mike? asked his driver. These dining coaches. Driver, I think we can help. Mike outlined his plan, and his driver was nodding by the time the small engine had finished. Mike's driver got on the radio, and had explained it all to Control by the time they reached Dalesdale Station. As Mike departed, his radio came to life once again. Mike Alpha from Bert Alpha. Food will be waiting at Marthwaite Station, under the name E-Hat. In the forest, Bert's driver put the radio away and turned to the maid of honour. The food is on the way, Mom. Thank you. Emily replied. She stepped over to Bert. Excuse me, Bert? Yes, Mom? I understand Mike is actually covering one of your trains for this run. That's correct, Mom. 
In that case, could you tell me when he may be getting here? Bert considered it for a moment. In about one hour, ma'am. It's a clear day, so I suspect it will be sooner rather than later. We should be able to feel that. Thank you, Bert. You're welcome, ma'am. The wedding started as Bert backed down towards Farquhar Road to clear the main line. He was relieved it had worked out, thanks in no small part to Mike and that maid of honour, Emily. A little while later, Mike arrived at Marthwaite Station. Spotting a delivery truck waiting by the tracks, he whistled twice. Have you got a food delivery? Should be for E. Hat. Sure enough, the van did have the food for the wedding. It was quickly loaded into the kitchens of the two dining coaches. Straight into the ovens and fridges it went. Mike's departure had only been a couple of minutes behind schedule, and he accelerated eagerly, keen to make up that time. As his wheels pounded the rails, the wedding food sizzled along. All the preparation had been done by the caterers, only the actual cooking itself was needed. As Mike approached the wedding venue, he heard somebody speaking over a tannoy. When I first met Kate, I had no idea how much my life would change from the bed. Sounds like they're up to the groom's speech already, Mike. We'll have to get the food unloaded quickly. Mike stopped next to the clearing. His driver, the cooks, and three of the groomsmen started unloading the food. Soon, they were done. Mike whistled as he pulled away. He'd done his part, and just in the nick of time, too. Later that evening, some of the small engines were resting in the shed. So how did your wedding special go, Bert? There was a hiccup or two. Bert explained about the catering mix-up, and Mike told the others how he'd sorted it out. Ah, so, the dining coaches are useful after all, then? Well, I, uh, I suppose they are. The other engines chuckled and went to sleep. Early the next morning, the engines received a visitor. Good morning, engines. Good morning, ma'am. Bert glanced at the other engines. This is Emily. She was the maid of honour at the wedding. I've just come by to say thank you for what you engines did yesterday. Kate and Tim are off on their honeymoon, but they asked me to let you know how grateful they are to you for making their wedding a success. I'll be sure to let Mr Duncan know how impressed we were with your actions too. Bert and Mike exchanged a look. Thank you, ma'am. Duck, Donald, Douglas and Oliver have always spoken highly of you and your railway. They have? Yes, and it's clear to me why that is the case. Emily glanced at her watch. I'm afraid I must be going, but it was a pleasure to meet you all. Pleasure to meet you too. Mike's thoughts turned to what Olivia had said last night. She'd been right, he thought. Turns out those dining coaches were useful after all.